I felt it was important, at least in my life, and I think for many of us as well, that we need to see our shepherd. We need to see Jesus more. Uh, because we're not, I think, being able to appreciate him as he should be appreciated. Our minds are distracted by troubles and cares and worries. And uh, the mask, the dreaded mask, I still have it in my pocket. You know, wherever I go, I have to put my mask on or take it off. So before we get into a study of Psalm 23, I would invite you who are here, who are downstairs, who are at home, wherever you are, let us pray and invite God's special blessing. Heavenly Father, we are privileged to be here in this house dedicated to your honor and glory. We thank you for each person here, for each young person, for families and visitors. We praise you that we can be here today, that we can experience your presence. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us words of eternal life, eternal truth from your holy scriptures. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray. Amen. Psalm 23 is one of those passages of Scripture in the Bible that is frequently memorized, read at funerals, or besides sick beds of those who are who are coming to an end of their lives. But more than that, um, the poetry, the imagery is profound. The, the psalm itself goes back probably a little over 3,000 years. And Christians over the generations, not only Christians, but our, our Jewish friends um, in the Jewish faith have read this psalm and have received from it comfort as well. And so uh, this psalm is believed, uh, was more or less confirmed to have been written by King David, who is much more of an older person like me and some of you. He's an old man perhaps by this point in his life and he's looking back to a time, a simpler time, dare I say, a simpler time when he knew from personal experience what it meant to be a shepherd. Because he himself was a shepherd boy. And he had to take care of his father's sheep. Being the youngest in the family, he got saddled with the worst job. Because being a shepherd was no easy task. And according to some historians was a, an occupation that was looked down upon. After all, who wants to take care of sheep? But David did it as, a, as an obedient son. But not only did he do it and uh, was good at it, but he learned important lessons from it. And some of these lessons he shares with us in Psalm 23. So I think what we should do is open our Bibles to Psalm 23, and I, my Bible is not the King James, so thy words might be different, but it's pretty much the same as the King James. And I'll read to you Psalm 23. It's not a very long psalm before we start our study. So if you have Psalm 23, turn in your Bibles, open it up. I'll put my glasses on to make sure I see things properly. And let's listen to the words of this psalm. It begins, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul, verse 3. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. 
for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it starts. David, King David, says, The Lord is my shepherd. He is not a shepherd. He's not the shepherd, but he is my shepherd. My shepherd. Doesn't matter about anybody else, but the Lord is my shepherd. And my question to all of you is that, can you say with the same kind of conviction as King David that the Lord is your shepherd? I hope so. Because if you can say that with conviction, with certainty, that the Lord is my shepherd, you acknowledge that you are his sheep. You are his sheep. And if you and I are sheep in the Lord's flock, then we are in good care, are we not? We are in good care. Because the Lord goes on to say, as expressed in this psalm by David, that he will make you and I to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. And actually, I missed a point at the very beginning. If the Lord is my shepherd and I am his sheep, I shall not want. I know what some people think. How is this possible? I shall not want. I want lots of things. I want a new car. I'd like a new job. I'd like more money in the bank. You know, there's lots of things I want. And yet it says in the psalm, I shall not want. Lord, get real with me. What are you talking about? I believe God is saying that everything that is needful for you as my sheep, I will provide. Some people have lots of money. Some people don't have lots of money. But ultimately, the shepherd knows what I need, what I can handle. There's no point having a lot of money if I don't know how to handle it. Would you agree? You know, if I, if I was rich like Abraham, or even King David, for that matter, who wrote this psalm, and I just wasted the money, I... I I wasted it. I didn't invest it wisely. I didn't use it to better the country, say, in the exa- example of King David. Then, then it's been a waste. It's, if I use it on myself, I've, I, I'm, I'm, I'm developing selfishness. And so, yes, whether I have a lot or a little, it doesn't matter. But what matters is that God knows what I can handle. And he says, you will not want, you shall not want. David in this psalm says, from his experience, he didn't want. When he was a shepherd boy, God took care of him. When he was running for his life, being hunted like an animal from King Saul, he knew God knew what he needed and God provided for him. And God is saying to us today, through this psalm written by King David, God knows how to take care of you as long as you are his sheep. I'd rather be a sheep, wouldn't you? I'm I'm telling you, I think a sheep has it pretty nice if the Lord is the shepherd. Not only that, remember, the shepherd leads his sheep. He leads them to green pastures. He leads them beside still waters. He provides for the necessities of life. And in our, the remaining verses, if we take a look at this next slide, I love the picture. There's the shepherd in the distance. 
Look at the sheep following the shepherd. And it says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So what does the shepherd first do for us according to this psalm? Well, he takes care of our our physical needs, our need for food, our need for water, our need uh, for shelter. He takes care of all of that. And having done that, he then leads. He then leads us along the paths of righteousness, of right doing. Because then there's a work. There's a work to do, a work of obedience, a work of service, shall we say. Now, I'm moving from the sheep to you and I, right? So we're going to be moving back and forth between the sheep and and our lives as human beings today. So the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, provides for our needs, whether rich or poor. He provides for our comforts, the necessities of life. He knows what we can handle. He knows how to to guide and direct. And then, having done all of this for us, he says, follow me. And as sheep, we follow him in paths of righteousness, in paths of obedience, in paths of right doing, in, in ways that will honor and glorify his name. Right? Because it says in the verse... He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's not about you and me. It's not about I. It's not about looking good. Lord, what can you do for me so I can look good? So I can achieve greatness before the eyes of of man. So I can be a big in the church of God. That's not what it's about. That's not what God is concerned about. He wants you and I to be sheep, to be his sheep, to follow his voice and follow him as he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Because in the end, when he comes to claim all of us, his sheep, and take us home to live with him in heaven, he will, it will be because we have brought glory to his name in reflecting his character of goodness on this earth. It's about what we bring to God in the honor and respect that is due his holy name. So there we are. I don't know which one of those sheep you are, but just imagine, you're one of the sheep. Boys and girls, you're one of those sheep, and you're following Jesus. And then the psalm goes on to say this. Because sometimes when we are walking with the shepherd, and we're following the shepherd, we go through dark places. We go through dark times, experiences that are fearful. And David knew, King David knew what that was about. I mentioned it a moment ago. He was hunted like an animal for years by King Saul, who sought to kill him out of jealousy. David's life was in peril. Remember the, the, boy, uh, the shepherd boy facing Goliath? David knew that by experience, and he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, church, we've got to spend a few minutes on this section of the psalm, because inevitably, you and I, are going to be led, if you will, we are going to pass through dark times. We are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. For some, it might be facing literal death. For some, it might be facing a trying situation in marriage, in employment. Whatever the dark time is, it's represented for us here in this slide, in these words of scripture, 
But it, it, I find it amazing that King David says that even though you and I go through times like this, we don't have to be afraid because God is with us. Remember, the, we're with the shepherd. We are following him. And if we follow the shepherd, and the shepherd leads us through these dark times, then as long as we are with the shepherd, we don't have to be afraid. Isn't that true? We, of course, like the sheep, might get a little bit nervous. We might get, up, we might get scared because it's a dark valley. There are a lot of wolves out there. We might even hear them in the distance. But, it, but we know our shepherd. And we know the shepherd knows how to take care of his sheep. And with that confidence, we face those dark times. And God says, you don't need to worry. <clears throat> now, I have to tell you something. Sheep are not the brightest animals in the world. Perhaps you've seen or know from experience, if you've grown, on a, grown up on a farm, that sometimes sheep get themselves into trouble. They get themselves into trouble by getting stuck in holes. They shouldn't be around. I've seen pictures of sheep that get their heads stuck between the slats on a fence, and they don't know how to get their heads out. Sometimes sheep will go to the precarious edges of cliff surfaces and kind of meander down a part of the way and then they're stuck and they don't know how to get out? Why do you think sheep get themselves into trouble? Curiosity. Curiosity. Yeah. They wander away. That most definitely. They're not, they're not following the shepherd closely, are they? Sheep are easily distracted. Sometimes they get caught in thickets. Sometimes they get hurt. And they start bleeding because they wander too far away from the flock. So, <clears throat> what does the shepherd do? Does the shepherd just say, enough with that sheep. I'm tired of that sheep. That sheep is nothing but trouble. That's okay. He's a goner anyway. And just go on. Is that, what, is that what our good shepherd does? No, I like that. No, our good shepherd doesn't do that. Instead, what does our good shepherd do? He goes after the sheep. In fact, you know, Jesus... Oh, thank you, Elder Nick. You know, in fact, Jesus, in the New Testament, in a number of instances, talks about how the shepherd, a real shepherd, loves his sheep is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. He's not a hireling. He's not somebody that's there for the money. He's not somebody there doing a job. But he's there caring for the sheep because he loves the sheep. A real shepherd loves the sheep. God loves you and I, his sheep. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But it's our choice to make whether we stay with the shepherd or we wander away through stubbornness, through unbelief, we wander away. And I, I think I better drink some water. Now, I got a phone call. Uh, just the other day, and I won't say too much about it, except this, that it is so discouraging and sad to hear when, when someone who knew the Lord says in no uncertain terms, I don't believe that stuff anymore. It's pretty sad. Here I am thinking about this sermon, thinking about the good shepherd and what he means to you and I, his sheep. 
and how the good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. In fact, Jesus did lay down his life for his sheep. And that someone who knew this, who at one time believed this, can say in no uncertain terms, I don't believe that stuff anymore. It's heartbreaking. Because according to this word, he that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son hath not life. A soul could be, if not already, lost for eternity. How valuable is a sheep? A moment ago I said that a hireling, somebody who doesn't love the sheep, might say, well, I have 99 sheep. If I lose one, who cares? For that shepherd, so-called shepherd, that sheep is of not much value. But according to the Bible, according to our good shepherd, he would leave the 90 and 9 to go search for that one sheep. That one sheep is of infinite value in the eyes of God. The price paid by God himself to save you and I, his sheep, from eternal destruction is, a, is an infinite price. It's God expended all that he could give in order to save you. Think about it. Just you. Never mind anybody else in this church. But think about it in a personal sense. He gave all to save you from destruction. This same God who has given all of this has loved you and I with an everlasting love, with a love that is unappreciated. And we, we treat human life in some parts of this world like garbage. It's not worth anything. And yet the God of heaven, God of this universe, so loved this world that he gave Jesus Christ to save us. That's, a, that's an amazing truth. To think that some people hear this truth and turn away from it is tragic. To think that some of us, Sabbath by Sabbath, read about this truth, go on and on about it in our minds, and yet it, be, it seems like it's o an old story, and, and our ears are dull of it, we're tired of hearing it, yet tell me something new. Well, I've got news for all of us. We're not here to be entertained with new stuff, to be intrigued with new stuff. We are here to understand the old stuff. Many of us don't understand, or in a deeper sense, what God has been telling us and trying to tell us generation after generation. Over 3,000 years, if not longer, the psalm itself, Psalm 23, is at least 3,000 years old as we know it. And it's been uh, telling this truth to generations of people, trying to impress upon our minds this wonderful fact that our good shepherd loves us, we, his sheep, and will die, lay down, and in fact did lay down his life for us. Now notice, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now, that's amazing. When I really think about it, I get afraid when I begin to doubt that God knows what he's doing. I get afraid when I begin to doubt that my good shepherd is doing good for me. And when I begin to doubt, I begin to get afraid because I don't know in whom I should have confidence. And of course, Satan is at work to say, well, you know, why are you even following the good shepherd? If he was really good, don't you think he'd do something about your problem, your situation? And the devil attacks us when we're down, when we're vulnerable, and he tries to unsettle our trust in Jesus, our trust in, the, in our Savior. And he does it all too often very successfully. But I will fear no evil. 
when I really believe that God is with me. If I'm his sheep and he is my shepherd, I will fear no evil. And it goes on to say something very interesting. Not only is God with me, but his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Some Bible commentaries suggest, and and you see it in the picture here, there's the shepherd with his staff, and it has a little hook on the end. And that the shepherd's staff is uh, twofold in nature. One, it's, it's used to smack the sheep on the behind if the sheep is, is uh, not listening properly. The shepherd doesn't do it because he delights in making the sheep feel sore on, the, on, uh, on, the, on his, his or her behind. No, he does it out of love. So the shepherd's staff with the hook on the end to maybe catch it around the neck and pull it gently in another direction. Or if he has to be more firm, the rod, maybe the longer part of it, to use it as a little bit of a smack. It's all for our comfort, right? That's how King David put it. I will fear no evil, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Have you ever felt comforted when you have been under the discipline of God? It's, I, you know, when my dad, and I, mind you, my dad, whose dad is ever perfect? My dad is not perfect. Maybe I won't make this comparison because it's probably going to explode in my face. So I will leave that one alone. But I will say this, that the Bible says that God chastens us as a, as a father chastens his son. And a father loves his son or daughter and has to discipline them, not because he delights in making life hard for them, but he wants what's best for them. So the Lord is the same way. And notice it's in, it's in those valley times, in those dark times, that we need the rod and the staff. God, it's easy to love God. It's easy to be a sheep led by the shepherd when it's nice and sunny out and, the, and there's lots of grass to nibble on and there's plenty of water to drink. It's easy to follow the shepherd then. But when times get dark and uncertain and trying and harrowing and frightening, those are the times that sometimes God has to take a firm approach to, to us as his sheep in order to make sure that we continue to follow him. If we don't, we could, we could lose our way completely and be lost. Not only does God do all of this, but he says in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. We're in, the, we're in the valley of darkness, the valley of the shadow of death. And what is God doing? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Those that seek to do me harm. Those who want to hurt me, uh, humiliate me. And you throw in the other words you want. But he says, not only does he prepare this banquet... But he anoints your head with oil. In, in the Middle East, in the time of Christ, honored guests would receive an anointing by the host. They would be honored with oil. They would be, it was a way of showing respect to this honored guest. You would anoint the head with oil. And God says to us as sheep that you are my honored guests. You are my honored guests. I anoint your head with oil. And David's response is, with oil, my cup overflows. I, like he's just, it's, it's, he's just filled to overflowing from the goodness and generosity of God. The fact that God, the Father in heaven, 
honors him, a lowly sheep, with a banquet, with a special anointing of oil on the head to mark that, that this is a special guest of mine. God would do all of this for him. And then he concludes this psalm with this wonderful, wonderful uh, concluding verses. Surely, yes, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I want you, before we conclude, to turn with me to John chapter 10. And I'd like us to listen to the words of Jesus that have been recorded for us. And we'll begin at verse 11. So turn there to John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. And I want you to listen to the words of Jesus as we conclude our worship service time together. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. I see some people are still looking. I, I want to make sure you're there. Now, I think most of us are there. Listen to these words of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Amen. God's sheep will hear his voice, and they will know his voice, and they will respond and follow the Good Shepherd.